we have a motion to uh, bring the meeting to order? So moved. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor, let's roll. Aye. 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 Today's agenda. All right, we have public guests. I don't think no, no guests. No uh, guests. I think we're going to have a staff. Um, come in, uh, Kurt uh, is stuck in traffic. Um, he's going to come in a little later and do a little report on the mosquito uh, control efforts that Environmental Health did uh, during the summer. Um, so hopefully um, he'll be here on time. So okay, all in is stuck in traffic because there was an accident, I believe. So all right, I neglected to ask if we're rolling. Oh, we are rolling. Okay. Yes, yes. And um, Dr. Linda Mood called, and um, he would like to be excused from coming today since he's out of town. All right, uh, one approval of today's agenda items. We have a motion to approve. I did notice on 5.1, I think that's supposed to say October 21st, 2022. Yes. <laughs> Duly noted. Okay, do we have a motion to approve with the one change with the date in 5.1? Moved. Okay. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, did anyone notice anything in the September 16, 22 minute meet, uh, meeting minutes? Do we have a motion to approve them? Second. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, are there any comments on the bill schedule? A um, couple quick comments, and I'd like them read for you. Um, those you might have seen those two bills up in a previous uh, expense report, um, but because um, we had to replace the checks, one for Fab uh, for $5,600, um, they did not receive the check, so we had to wait until uh, you know, a certain period of time before we issue another one. Um, which we did in September, and this is for the um, SA Communal, which is uh, um, the fire extinguisher uh, servicing company. Um, we did, um, this is an extra $101. You might have seen a bill from them earlier, uh, but uh, this bill was to get fire extinguishers for the training we've done for our staff. Um, so that uh, those are the two, uh, you know, uh, abnormal kind of flags. I would, um, Everything else uh, looks normal. That's our usual bill schedule. Anyone else see anything on the bill? Questions? All right. Do we have a motion to approve the September 22 bill schedule? Second. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, 2.4, we need to recognize uh, following revenue, 2.41 as a MRC RISE award. That's an intro grant um, that uh, the Medical Reserve Corps um, um, uh, is beneficial of this award. Um, that's, that's in the amount of $50,000. And 2.42, um, that's the Narcan fiscal year 23 project in the amount of $50. That um, $50 is um, is what we missed last month, I believe, as far as recognizing. Uh, we did put the whole amount, but we did not put the $50. So I uh, would like for the board to recognize it this, um, uh, in October. Okay, do we have a motion to approve 2.41 and 2.42, $50,000 and $50? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Now we have to approve the appropriation increases. 2.51. Yes, and that's the uh, uh, emergency preparedness fiscal year uh, project for 23. Um, we needed um, some more money in the supplies line item in the amount of $126.19. And 2.5.2, uh, 
um, the drug overdose prevention fiscal year 23 projects. Um, we need uh, we need to rec uh, appropriation increase in the amount of twenty nine thousand eight hundred ninety one dollars and seventy five cents. OK, questions anyone? Do we have a motion to approve two point five one and two point five two appropriation increases? So move. Second. Second. OK, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, on 2.6, we do have um, two plumbing permits. They were filed um, for two Habitat for Humanity homes, and um, it's been customary and um, for the board to waive the fee, the plumbing fee um, for those homes. Um, and we are asking the board to approve to waive the plumbing permit fees for the following for the following homes, um, 2.6.1, $150 for the home located on 1315 um, only Avenue in Findlay and 2.6.2 and the amount of $150 as well for the home located on 1331 only Avenue in Findlay, Ohio. Can I have a somebody check and see if that's spelled right? Not that it matters, but I don't think it's it's only it should be oh, it should be only. O-L and E-Y, oh, well, uh, yeah. e right? And O-L. O-L. And the little repeat this. All right. <laughs> All right. Put the proper spelling here. <laughs> Do we have a motion to approve 2.61, 2.62? So moved. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. First reading environmental health scheme. All right. Um, I'm going to um, introduce it a little bit. I'm going to have Lindsay walk you through it, see if you have any questions. It's that time of year where we do pre readings before the end of the year on the fees to be charged next year. Um, this kind of came out a little small, so I did put a uh, handout for you guys. Uh, and we knew all along here that uh, we were going to lose some revenue in, um, in those fees uh, because we didn't put the time um, back in the pandemic. And when we do uh, an analysis or um, expense studies or, or, or cost study, uh, we go back, you know, uh, a year. So we're always a year behind. Um, that's why um, fees are going to go down a little bit. On the um, right hand side of the paper, I think they did put some comparisons for you guys um, for the different counties, what they charge for the different classifications, and that that will uh, that will put us kind of uh, a little cheaper than most of them. So um, but it is what it is. We cannot charge more than the time we put in there, and it's going to take us a couple day, a couple of years to recoup, probably from what happened like a couple of years ago. So this is our first reading. Um, we'll keep um, working on the numbers and make sure we uh, check them and double check them and bring them back next month. But we we want an approval on that first reading. So this is less because uh, we spent less time. That's correct. Because of it. Fewer inspections, right? That's correct. Okay. I'm going to let Lindsay explain it a little more here, and then we'll go from there. Good morning, everyone. So um, kind of what I've done is if you look at this 2022 fee column, that is what we're currently collecting at the local level. Um, after all the information gets put in the cost analysis, it spits out this 2023 column, which is the maximum amount that we can charge. Um, then we have this 2023 reduction column. So last year when cost analysis went through, um, there was that last minute when the board, we made the decision to do the different um, salary scale and our insurance, different things. I wholeheartedly forgot to make one correction on one page and that spit out that we actually collected too much money in 2022. So I have to account for that error in 2023. So that's what it shows. This is, we have to deduct $2.82 off of the $88.77. So in reality, we can only collect in this $85.95. Um, so that's how I've come up with this 22 or 23 proposed fee um, list. Yes, we are going to have a little bit of a deduction. Um, I think we're going to probably even have a little bit more less because of um, we're seeing establishments closing. So unless we start getting establishments continuing to stay open or new ones come into town, I, I think we're still at risk for that. Um, 
like Kareem said, over here is our neighboring town fees. Those are their 2022 fees. Um, you can see that we're kind of on the lower end of those other counties. Um, and some of that can just be because of the numbers of establishments they have. Um, so up through here, we have all of our food fees. All of our risk levels are going to be decreasing. And when I say risk levels, these are going to be like your Domino's, your Prita Rodis, um, your Subways. As we get into the commercial risk level greater than 25 square feet, this is going to be your Walmart, the larger stores. So those establishments should not change because we don't have very many of them anyhow. Then we come down here into plan review fee. Currently, the regulations do not require us to do. Um, there's not a specified type of cost methodology to do on that. And in the past, we've always done a 50% of the local fee for each of the categories. So what we would do is if somebody was applying for a risk level one license, we would charge them $44 for their application for plan review, which is that's something that somebody does when they first start getting started. They're submitting their menu, the layout, their equipment. It's quite time consuming. Um, and then, like I said, that would be $44 of like a risk level one, $100 for a risk level two. Um, after having some conversation and some meetings with the state and just kind of seeing what's happening around us, um, I ran some numbers on how much time we're truly spending in that program. And I think it might be beneficial to us to do a flat rate. Doesn't matter if you're a risk level one or you're a risk level four. Um, because at the end of the day, we were finding we're spending as much time on those risk level ones sometimes as we are on a risk level four for like a Walmart. Um, so I think that's kind of what Kareem and I thought would work out best after reviewing those numbers. Um, and as you can see, it's across the board with our neighboring, you know, Wood and Seneca, they're going them per category. Wyandotte and Putnam are going flat rates. The mobile fee, we're going to see an increase on that. Not shocked by that because we saw an increase in like 20 new mobiles last year. After the pandemic hit, everybody thought new career path. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, mobile, we can't charge a plan review fee. So all that time gets wrapped up in those licenses. So all the time that we spent with those new people. Yes, everybody who's been in business for a while, they're going to have to help pay for it too. So, I mean, we're looking at quite a significant jump there. Um, vending machines, that's controlled by the CPI index and um, Whatever cost analysis spits out, since it was spitting out less than the $22, we've got to go with the $13. It's a program that we've automatically lost money in for years. Um, another thing that's hurt us is during the pandemic, we did not do inspections at every location. We only hit 50%, which is what we're law says we can do, but in the past, we've always hit it at 100%. Um, temporaries, those are the permits that we're issuing at, you know, like the fair, um, the craft shows. Currently, we charge $40. Cost analysis says we need to drop it down to $34. So, um, then we're going to move to the sewage program. Sewage program does not require us to change every fee every year. So, we can kind of, you know, just review what we think might be a of best interest to us. Um, site evaluations, that's a permit that is um, anybody who's doing a new build or it's a fee that's getting costs for people that are doing new lot splits as well. Um, currently, that fee's been stuck at $468 for quite a, actually before the merger even. Um, and it was hard to kind of there's just a lot of ups and downs since the merger, plus with our staffing issues in that program. So once we finally got a consistent two RSs that were working in it continuously and some more stable numbers, it's spitting out a $733 fee. Um, Green and I kind of talked about that a little bit um, when we took into consideration of what's going on around us a little bit. 
Um, and we came up with a better number at 475. Now, obviously, if you guys don't agree and you think it needs to be something else, we can take a look at that. Um, next one's the replacement sewage permit. That's the permit that anybody who is replacing their sewage system. So, for example, I live in the country, I need to replace my sewage system. Cost analysis says it should be $735. I, Kareem and I talked about that a little bit. You gotta remember, sometimes you're running into people, limited income. We want people to be able to replace it because we know at the end of the day what's best. So, Kareem and I came up with $350. Minor subdivision form for an existing dwelling. That is for people that are, um, primarily they're, they're doing estate planning. So they're splitting off the home from the farm to get ready for estate stuff. Um, there's a lot more work involved in those than when we first started doing all of that because those individuals have to do soils. So we have to go out there, set flags, evaluate where the current system is, review all that soils work and make sure that they can replace it in the future. So, um, like I said, cost says $324. Kareem and I kind of came up with $200. Um, review of subdivision of lots. This is just a logistic thing that has to go hand in hand with that site evaluation number. So that's the only reason I've got that on there. Um, water, there's really not a whole lot changing here because we've always had that read a $30 trip charge plus lab cost. So that way, anytime lab costs changed, we could change our fee. But I just wanted to give you an idea of what lab costs look like and what this kind of really means. Um, it costs $49 for us just to pay the lab when you get a regular bacteria sample done. So by the time you do $49 plus $30, you're looking at $79 to get your water sampled. Um, any other questions? How often do water samples, are they needed? How often? So anytime somebody drills a new well and they pull a permit from us, we include the cost of that water sample in that permit so they don't have to pay an extra fee with that. Primarily what's happening here is people that are doing real estates or you do get a random person that's just interested. We try to promote, get them to pull the sample themselves so they can save the $30. Yeah. That's one way of doing a cost savings, but sometimes you get people that just aren't comfortable with it. I think you've seen the trend since the merger here. We, if we are fluctuating with the fees, we would try to do it gradually and no drastic changes up or down. Um, and I think uh, that's why when the when the uh, sewage study came back with 733, mm -hmm. we thought this is going to be way out of um, control um, as far as charging the homeowners that, um, like Lindsay mentioned, we want them to do this. This is good for public health, and that's the bottom line for us. If we have, if we can recoup some of that here, we will. But we want people to be compliant instead of you know spending the time chasing uh, chasing around the compliance. Just to play off of that a little bit. So when you come in to build a new home, you're going to start out with that site evaluation fee, which is currently $468. Once the home is um, approved and you're ready to install your sewage system, now you got to purchase another permit, which is $368. So now you're over $800 in those two permits. Then you're going to purchase a well permit that's over $300. So you got $1,000 real fast in those three permits. Um, so just kind of keeping that in mind, if you go to $733 and you got another $300 per dollar permit, I mean, you got over $1,000 right there. Um, it's already a challenge sometime having these conversations with our um, <laughs> public. <Sure>. So. <laughs> uh -huh. To make it a little easier for Susan and not having her take the grunt of it too. <laughs> we'll have to pay her more then. <laughs> and we want to keep Susan. <laughs> I'm looking at the <clears throat> food license. I operate in quite a few counties, 13, 14 counties. And you know, with the merger, I think you guys have become really efficient and that's good for the people in this county. And I'm, Kind of happy we're priced overpriced. 
you know, that just shows how efficient you guys are when you look at the actual costs. You know, to complete everything you have to do in that realm, that's pretty good. You're looking at the top part. Yeah, the top part. Mm -hmm. I I get I get this. I notify everybody that's affected, and I get these from, you know, Franklin County, Wyandotte County, Lucas County, Wood County, like all over the place. But they always tell you ahead of time that hey, these may be coming, and then. Mm -hmm. They are, and these are the sure. changes. They have to um, notify. We we publish them in the paper as well. And once once the third reading is done and they're approved. Yeah, and this is one check I always sign personally every year, because uh, I like to know. Like, yep, it's a uh, that's a little bit of a challenge. Well, I was just noticing that uh, all the adjacent uh, counties hmm. fees are more than ours, and I didn't know whether that meant we need more pizza parlors or what. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think their geography is a little more spread out. They're less efficient than we are because they might have a few less restaurants. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. You know, the department, let's say. How and how much is that going to affect the budget? You said we have less restaurants. Like, what's the oh, count? Is it that's what we metric? talked about last year a little bit? It's I mean, a, ballpark, like not an exact number, is it like 80, 5% or? It was about 80,000. 80, and that's why the state um, did, uh, did give us, give us like 140,000 to plug in the gap in the next two years here. So um, that 80,000 probably will come from uh, from what the state gave the health departments to okay. plug in that gap. So so the license fee totals will be down about 80,000. Correct. OK, correct. All right. So there is a stop gap. That's that is correct. Yeah, like I said, we're going to see probably the same thing a little bit next year. Hopefully it will be less and less of a, of a change or decrease. Um, I think the good news this year with the study that uh, Lindsay uh, did with the mobiles, because we spent a lot of time on those mobiles, you have, you have to keep going back and forth and make sure they have everything, you inspect them every time. Um, so, you know, that, that fee going up, I think it's, um, it's, it's going um, to help a little bit. And how many of the mobiles that we see in our county have like the master state license and that county by county, how many of them? They all get licensed in their home county and then they can go anywhere in yeah. Ohio. OK, but, but then you have to. But those are ours. Yeah, yeah. Well, when we do the study, we just count ours Correct. when we license. OK, but you they can go anywhere. Time for yep. any of the out of county yep. locals. Well, I know, but you do have cost. For that, that is correct. Right. Yeah, OK. <laughs> any other questions? I said we'll revisit those next month as well. Um, and um, if you guys have any questions between now and then, you can answer them. As you, with the storage numbers, if you guys feel that we've got those too high, too low, or you want us to reconsider something, do some other calculations, please, now's the time to have the conversation. So it would be reflected in the second reading. So the line for the max fee is that like what you guys are projecting for the cost to do this next year? That's how much the study said we can charge maximum. OK, so we, yeah, we're bound by ORC to kind of do a study for all the pro, or not for all the program for the food, but um, but I think what we do every year, uh, we do study for all the programs using the food. Yeah. And then how many of these permits or fees per year? What you guys get? Is it 50? Is it 100? Is it um, site evals average anywhere from 18 to 25 a year. Um, then sometimes when the lot split things come through, so what gets a little wonky is you have somebody come in to do that lot split. They'll split the homestead off. That becomes an existing parcel. That be only will get charged the um, currently the $150 fee, but now you have the farm instead that's left over. Regional planning changed their rules two years ago. Anything that's under 25 acres, so if it's two to 25 acres remaining, it has to have Board of Health approval. So those individuals have to do then a site evaluation fee. So we end up with catching about 10 to 12 of those then extra a year. 
So if we moved up or down and another twenty five dollars or something on these, it wouldn't be like it's I'm not gonna good to fit on the yeah. Okay. I think that the impact is minimal compared to okay, we want people to comply. It's for the best interest of public health to keep it a little lower. And and you guys haven't made a big move here. I, I mean, for me, it's like your discretion is you guys know what you need to do. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. really reasonable to and me. I think yeah. it. Like I said, we'll see what next year is going to bring, but hopefully we can inch it up a little mm -hmm. bit at a time just to keep up with, you know, the inflation right. and everything else. But but not right now is not a good time to kind of, you know, double. Okay. Yeah. OK. You guys don't have any questions? We would like a motion, then we'll do a roll call for that first reading. So moved. Second. Um, I'm going to do a roll call. Sorry. Um, BJ. Yes. Nancy. Yes. Karen. Yes. Robin. Yes. Bill. Yes. Brian. Yes. And Dr. Linda Mood is excused. All right. I think uh, the first reading passed. All right. Next topic here. Um, If you um, if you guys remember a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic here, uh, we talked a lot about working with BGSU um, on establishing a public health undergraduate program. Uh, we we work a lot with them on the curriculum, what to teach in there, um, what they need. Um, I think that was a pretty good um, you know um, uh, partnership with them. Now it came full circle after the pandemic. They started their undergrad. Uh, program in public health. Um, a lot of their um, focus with that program is environmental health. Um, so with the shortage of sanitarians and the part time we've seen, uh, we um, they propose that we 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 do partnership and establish um, an uh, academic health department here in Hancock County that will work closely with BGSU and their programs on um, uh, by placing, you know, uh, their students uh, in, in different programs. It, it will be beneficial for us as well uh, to get interns, especially, you know, when it comes to certain um, certain area. Um, environmental health is one of them. Um, I know we do have a lot of agreements and side agreements too with a lot of uh, colleges around us for nursing. Again, nurses come in here all the time. Um, so Bowling Green is looking Academic health department is the equivalent of a teaching hospital, you know, for pu in public health sense. Um, I think this is um, this would be great um, for us again to uh, to benefit from what um, what what the what the university can offer us as far as research, as far as uh, uh, internships, um, and this way we'll get more people kind of um, involved and interested in public health, uh, you know. Uh, of specialties for the next five to ten years are going to be a big shortage. That's that's what everybody else is, is predicting. Uh, and um, uh, Bowling Green wanted to kind of establish that um, that relationship, and they reached out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we've been working with them on that. Um, it's gonna they're gonna have social workers. They can come in here and help with the uh, injury prevention. They can help with the Help Me Grow program. Um, there's a lot of specialties that we can uh, we can use. So um, at this point, what I'm asking the board is to authorize um, that we enter into an agreement with uh, with Bowling Green State University to establish Hancock Public Health as an academic health department. So in this original MOU is four years or five years, five years. That's the, that's for one year, um, and it's but it's renewable. So um, it's automatic every year if we don't, if the board comes back and say we want to opt out, we don't want that uh, partnership, we can come back and say uh, we don't want it. There's a. Uh, I said it was till 2027. Uh, That's what I thought I too. See. It's five years and then renewable every year with a six I, month. I think, yeah. Notice to terminate at any time during the meeting. Yeah. Uh, there should be a. Uh, um, mm -hmm. An end clause in it, but um, yeah, we'll make sure. And this is just a rough draft that they shared with us, and um, so we will um, we'll look at it once once we get the board um, 
you know, blessing to just go ahead with that project. We'll go ahead and before we sign anything, we will run it by our legal and make sure, um, you know, it's uh, it's tight. Um, they do have currently a couple um, agreements with a uh, couple health departments, um, and that's probably that's what they got that from, and it's kind of a form uh, thing. I read it, um, and I don't think there's anything risky in there for us. Um, it's uh, uh, it's a mutual benefit for Bowling Green to kind of place their students in real life experiences here, um, and it's a benefit for us to you know to team up with the uh, with the university like BGSU on on research, especially when it comes to environmental health. Uh, like I said, there's no shortage of, um, of um, nursing schools and stuff around us here, but we always struggled with the with the EH part of it. So um, I I would recommend that the board um, authorize that we uh, enter into such an agreement and um, and become um, an academic health department. Keep in mind this is going to be starting slow. Really, I met with the professors a couple of times before I bring in this, but uh, it's going to start slow. We have capacity. I mean, we cannot take 50 students, uh, so they understand that part of it. And um, all placement will be done with our consent. So, you know, that will be a coordinator on our side here, coordinator on the university side, and they will say, okay, you know what, we have two uh, environmental health students that that needs internships. Do you guys have openings? Then we'll come back here and we'll say, do we have a need? Then we'll say yes or no. So it's all contingent on what we can handle and what co our capacity is to to uh, to have students in here. But um, but I think long term, um, it's um, it, it's uh, it, it's a good thing because it it help us with QI projects. It, it help us with a lot of um, uh, the the uh, fab stuff that we're gonna be working on, uh, and it can be multidisciplinary. It's not, it's not only you know, nursing or engage and like I said, there's a they have a good social uh, social work uh, program up there too that, that we can benefit from. Um, that's my recommendations. Um, I understand that, uh, you know, um, there's a lot in that contract and, and you guys might want to take a look at it a little longer or think about it a little longer. Um, it's up to what uh, what directions you'll give me here and I'll take the marching orders. So uh, this says uh, the MOU will end on September 1st, 2027, but any time during, you can give a six month written notice to probably wind down the program mm -hmm. and then it renews every year. But doctor, your thoughts on this thing? The, cut, the collaboration between the university would kind of need. I think that. it's a great idea. I mean, yeah. one of the things coming out of the community health needs is workforce and what we can do in the community. And I think it's fine. On, on both fronts, from environmental for SITs, whatever, right. everything, yeah. right. nurses, everybody. Yep. Anybody else in the everybody else in the medical field here? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Is BG the only one offering the bachelor's in public health? Uh, that is correct. Here region. in our region, yes. And that's where we've gotten our latest environmental. Yeah, yeah. They they have a, a robust environmental health program there, um, and uh, I think. Again, looking looking forward here, we we need some we need staff, we need we need people, um, and I think it it will be beneficial to our uh, to our department where we can get people before they graduate, we get them to to try them to kind of see if they like it here, if we like what they do, then we can we can move on hiring if we are hiring, um, even if we're not, we can um, it will be a launching pad for them to apply anywhere in the state as well. So what would you see as um, risks related to this, if any? Um, the, well, the, I won't say a risk, but it needs a commitment. And I did talk to leadership about it a little bit because it's uh, it's going to be some um, uh, some staff time involved in there. Um, I know a lot of us used to look at interns that oh, we're not going to babysit here all day. Um, those are those are different because they're going to be working on projects, part of a classroom projects. Um, and the projects will be well defined on both ends uh, here at, at the university. So they'll come in here with a specific uh, uh, you know, project in mind that they're working on. Uh, they will report on that project afterwards and then we'll go from there. The risk is, is minimal to none. Like I said, anytime we feel like it's overwhelming to our staff or it's taking too much of our leadership time, um, we'll just we'll, we'll say we can't right now. We can place anybody, but I think long term it, it's going to help us establish ourselves as a regional health department. Um, you know, being um, 
I mean, you all know being a teaching hospital, it, you know, teaching health department, it's it's a big thing. Um, I think it was a commitment we did at the merger that we, it's, we're going to be a research facility. Uh, the projects we're working on with the with the hospital and Dr. Grace with that diabetes thing, it's it's one of those. Uh, but we want up we we want our staff to get involved in, in academia as well, writing papers, submitting, um, you know, poster uh, posters for conferences and stuff like that. I think we should be looking at that bigger picture more than just um, siloing ourselves just right here. Yeah, so, just a comment, BJ, if that's OK, Brian, I think absolutely. your question. Uh, I don't think there is any risk except a little bit what uh, Kareem said, and I don't think that you always think about when you have students it's a risk if they don't have a good experience because they go back and they talk mm -hmm. to everybody. Mm -hmm. We hear that about recruiting mm -hmm. residents, about mm -hmm. anything. So I think that's your risk that you don't have a good mm -hmm. product and mm -hmm. we'll have a good product. Kareem, maybe it's in here and I missed it. Uh, is there a length of time for the placements? Like, is it a semester? It's not a rotating it's usually a semester, but um, but it can be rotating. If the project takes more than one semester to finish, they can. Um, so it's there's no specific time. It's up to what the needs are here, and what the needs for um, for this for the uh, classroom. Is that defined in here, or do we need? Uh, I don't think it's defined, but maybe we need to. Yeah, that projects can be. Um, can be long. I mean, we can have interns that, you know, for the whole four years, um, if we need to, they come in maybe every summer and do help with the mosquito control or help with other projects. It's going to be meaningful. It's more than just having an intern here, you know, and kind of assign them to, to, to a person and, and go from there. It's going to be meaningful to both, you know, for us because we're investing time and knowledge in there and meaningful to the students because they want to, um, they want to, you know, gain some practical experience. So, Kareem, are you thinking um, that you're at, you're looking for approval this morning, or are you looking for a favorable? Yes, we think this is a good idea, and then you bring back the final like agreement. How However, you guys feel comfortable moving forward, um, and we can uh, we can do just keep working on that projects, and I'll I'll do it, and we'll bring in the final agreement next next month. Um, this way, we'll hash out all the details, and uh, we'll add some of the stuff that we need to add to it. Or we can uh, do authorization and just say, you know what, whenever you feel comfortable and you run it by legal, just go ahead and sign it and start it. We're gonna start ba baby steps. I'm not in a hurry. Uh, we, we're gonna we're gonna do it a little bit at a time. Even you know, um, so w I'm not in a hurry. And you know, between now and the end of the year, probably another semester will start next year. And you know, we can we can we can make it effective the first of the year. I, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not a legal person. I read through 99% of it, but it seemed mm -hmm. like it gave you flexibility to develop the program yeah. the way you yeah. need and that's, on that's both sides. Absolutely. And together to make it happen. Yeah, and that all the discussions were, were around, okay, they, they will have a coordinator that will work with us, and we will have a coordinator mm -hmm. here on our staff that will work with them. Um, let's say we have a social worker that needs some practical experience. They will will go and and talk to leadership, see what the needs are, what kind of projects they can work on, and they will hash out all those details before the final placement is done. So, as a point of budget, would this ever be a line item on the budget, or is this something you got this to is, track to see if later down the road it's like a home run I thing would, and we got to do? Yeah, I, there's no cost. At this point, I mean, the cost is an effort and time from um, my leadership here, and I think they're all willing and, and supporting that. Um, but moving forward, probably, if we feel like there's benefit, um, we can start looking at for some grants to fund those um, um, those positions for internships, maybe pay the students some stipend or something like that from coming down here or something like that. But that's in the future. Like I said, we're going to start slow and see um, where, 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 where this will take us. And this is going to be an opportunity for our staff to um, to kind of go and be in the classroom as well at certain times, present on their different programs, uh, tell the students that's that's what I've been doing here for 20 years and that's how it looks like. And um, I think that's that's important. That connection is important because uh, again, the next five, 10 years, I'm not looking good for um, for staffing. And, uh, and I think I also read where they can come and present here once a year. That is correct. CEUs. Yes. OK, yeah. oh, that's good. 
So if you guys feel more comfortable and we want a little more time to kind of um, digest all what's in those contracts, um, I'm fine with just you saying keep working on that project and we'll bring it back next month. I guess I'll think. I mean, I don't. The, the, I mean, it sounds like this is relatively new. I don't know if you ran it past whatever council you use for the department. Well, we use we use Cindy Land, the prosecutor's office, and um, um, she's busy, and it might take her a little time. But I'm hoping that if we run it by her early enough, she can um, um, she can bring it back by next meeting. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. This looks like a standard MOU. That yeah, I mean, it seems like a great idea to me, I, so I, yeah. I feel really favorable yeah. towards it, but I don't see any harm in just getting it kind of ironed out mm -hmm. and then bringing it yeah. back next month. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. I guess I'd like to hear that commitment, the time commitment, uh, you know, sure. as and we've been involved with this a lot in healthcare, and and myself as a preceptor at the hospital, I had great positive experiences with the students that came to me from any of the universities. It's a little bit more labor intensive at the beginning, mm -hmm. but then once they learn, they're just a great asset to you, give you more time and mm -hmm. this very well, hopefully positive we results. Can recruit some of them. I mean, yes. that's part of the, I think you're gonna see a lot more of this. We heard that the university is doing it here mm -hmm. uh, with Owens, even with the high schools, we, we've got, we're not going to hire our way out of this lack of staff. We've got to, we've got to keep the people that are yeah. around here. So, mm -hmm. and this is nothing new. We have we have MOUs with the University of Findlay on the different programs with the pharmacy students, with the nursing, but but we don't. It's not at the institution level. This is going to be signed by the president of BGSU. This is kind of you know, officially we're partners. We're you know, we're going to exchange ideas. We're going to exchange uh, you know capacities, we're going to exchange expertise here um, to make both better public health here in, in Hancock County and the student experience at BGSU. I guess I would uh, move to table this uh, for this, you know, it's an eight page fairly comprehensive document uh, that I think our board would be remiss if we did not study this a little better. Yes, I'll second that. Sure. So that's to develop the document better, but also have a legal opinion. So we'll, we'll table it to run it by uh, by council and to um, um, to finalize the contract and bring it back to the board. Sounds good. And in the meantime, any of the board members that would like to work closely with me on kind of understanding the really how this is going to work and some of the concerns you guys have, you're welcome to. A phone call away anytime. I love the idea, and mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it's I think this is this is going to be yeah. great for our um, growing as as a, as an agency here. Um, and um, um, again, this is not only keeping people and recruiting people in public health, but they have a, a masters of public health programs where they do have epidemiologists that comes out of it that the hospital can benefit from. A lot of other institutions can benefit from. So um, I, I think this is this is. This will be um, taking public health practice into next level. All right, so we got to define the motion. Yes, the motion is to run this past legal, develop finalize the document, it, finalize it better, and bring it back. Bring it back. Well, and I think the board should have, you know, some input to um, any questions that board members have. Um, oh, I, I don't know. I'll just speak for myself. I just saw it two days ago. Yeah, that's up. To, yeah, uh, we want everybody to be comfortable because we want your support as always. So um, any questions, any concern, we can run through them and, and bring it back to the full board. But individually reach out anytime, please. Okay. All right. All right. That seemed like a very conflicting long, long motion. <laughs> <laughs> we got the gist of it. We're going to table it until next meeting until we get more information to the board. Would that work? OK. Yes. Very good. 3.8. All right. I'm going to let Lindsay do the talking here a little bit. That's uh, another contract uh, to do plumbing inspection for commercial um, projects in Hardin County. So Lindsay. 
So some of you remember, uh, it's probably been two months ago now, I brought this up I'm kind of feeling out if it was something that we'd be interested in even or not. Um, so after working through the contract with Cindy Land, I've got that one covered already. Um, <laughs> and uh, Hardin County Legal has already reviewed it as well. Um, we're ready to move forward. So um, it's a contract. It's kind of, um, it'll be reviewed. I guess you could say, Jay. In December of every year, we can review it or there's the open clause that, you know, within 60 days they can submit that they don't want to be part of this or vice versa. Um, so what this means is we will be providing all uh, commercial plumbing inspections to Hardin County. So uh, as I reported before, they currently have six permits open. It's not like this is going to be, you know, 600 permits that we're taking on. Um, primarily a lot of work at ONU down there, um, probably some of the restaurants. I think Brian's worked with them in the past. Um, we will also report to Hardin County quarterly on how many permits have been issued, um, what the status of those permits are. And I think it's on page two. There's a fee portion that this covers. Oh, right there. Um, the Hancock County will retain 95% of all of the permit fees, and then that other 5% will go to Hardin County. Um, that fee will be submitted quarterly to them. Um, Susan and I will work with having a tracking mechanism in place so we can, you know, make sure we're doing everything. And like I said, Hardin County expects quarterly reports as well, so they can do their cross referencing too. Uh, this percentage is the same thing that's been happening between Erie County and Hardin County, so that's just kind of a standard thing that happens when people share the plumbing inspectors. So that's nothing out of the ordinary. Um, effective date would be January 1 of 23, so we're going to let everybody finish out here in 2022 and then we'll start fresh in 23. Uh, plan is, is if you guys are okay for us to get signatures today from the board president and then this will be forwarded to Hardin County and it'll have to catch their November board meeting. So then they'll get all the signatures and we should have everything signed and in our possession then in December and ready to go January. So we need action on this today so we can send a contract, take it to Harding County. Just a little background and, and Lindsay did a good job explaining a little bit, but um, Erie, uh, Harding County contracted all those years with Erie County Plumbing to do their inspection. Now the Erie Plumbing Inspector is really uh, trying to um, kind of He's trying to retire and take it a little easy, so that a lot of travel to him. So he reached out to us um, and said, OK, would you guys be able to take um, uh, inspections down in Hardin County because uh, they don't have a, a plumbing uh, uh, inspection program? Uh, we did uh, a lot of meetings. We met with uh, Eric, our plumbing inspector as well, to see what the capacity is and can he handle those few, um, few more inspections that are coming from down there? And he said that should be no problem. Um, actually, he liked the idea. So, um, uh, so in that in that respect, I think uh, we will um, will will take over those inspections. And again, that will establish us as a regional health department, and uh, you know, providing help whenever it's needed here to at least the neighboring counties as well. I think we, we should all be proud of that we are able to do that. And I recommend that you guys approve it. If we chose not to do it for some reason, and I think Brian touched on this before, this would all go back to the Department of Commerce. And so then if you're Brian and you're trying to get an underground inspection done, you could be waiting for days. Contractors don't like to wait for days on undergrounds because you're waiting. You got that concrete truck lined up and those guys are wanting mm -hmm. to come in. So this way we're going to be able to provide better timely service for those um, contractors couple questions. Uh, the uh, fee split, as I understand it, 95% uh, is the same that Hardin had with Erie? Correct. Do you think that uh, would benefit our department? 
It's better actually because we're closer. Yeah, we did a lot we're of travel. More money. Yeah. Erie is far. Yes. Yes. Erie yeah. yeah. would be a big drag. Yeah. We did quite a few counties. We don't do any other ones, right? Correct. I think Wyatt um, oversees 10 counties. Yeah, he's. Uh, it was a long time to get an inspection yeah. from them. Actually, the Department wow. of Commerce might have been quicker than that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, That's been saying it, something. You know, a couple times. Well, so. well, we're getting good reputation of a good service and a, and a quick and timely service. I think yeah. that's why. Well, and I think this is uh, more in keeping with uh, why we are accredited health department mm -hmm. because right. we mm -hmm. can service some other ad adjacent yeah. counties. Yeah. And uh, as I understand it, uh, their legal department and ours have reviewed this. Correct. And blessed it. And I have that all in writing. So <laughs> <laughs> it's liability. That's. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll make a motion to approve the agreement with Harden. Second. All right, we'll do a roll call on that. BJ? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Robin? Yes. Bill? Yes. And Brian? I'm going to abstain just because I have a business down there. And I don't want to, you know. All right. I think motion passed, though, and um, we can go ahead and at the end of this meeting sign the contract. <laughs> right. Okay, the next topic is as important, and we need action on it as well. You all heard about uh, our work with uh, trying to get an, an electronic uh, medical record uh, system going. Now that we have the mobile and uh, and learners on board, we have the clinics that have been struggling for a long time with HDIS. Um, I think um, Shannon helped me a lot with that project, and we did multiple meetings with the eClinical Works. That's the name of the company. Uh, we went back and forth. We had questions, even. Um, we had a couple presentations here for staff and um, and leadership who are going to be working with this. Um, and um, I think that the final uh, decision was hinged on Laura and um, Shannon going up to um, Ottawa County uh, to see the uh, the actual program, um, you know, work the actual staff working with the program and what some of the uh, feedback they got from there. It was mostly good feedback, and um, I think that. The decision is made to go ahead and, and purchase um, that thing at once we get your approval. Um, this is uh, if we sign it today, they're going to need a couple months here to set us up and migrate all the data. So probably it won't be live until uh, early next year. We're hoping for January and um, the total cost. We did purchase the population health module with it too. This is going to help us generate a lot of uh, reports for you guys on on where the you know where we have to put more efforts in it or more resources we need um, more of those yeah so um so i think uh what we the the final um the final negotiations um they came down with the price if we want to purchase the um the the population module which we decided it will be helpful for our um, health assessments as well moving forward uh, and generating those reports, it's going to be seven hundred forty nine dollars a month. Um, and that will be that's that will include training them coming in here and setting up, make sure they you know, they, they do training for our staff um, that includes all, all that stuff on the first page. Um, from there now, um, on top of this, we're going to have to um, to do the billing part of it as well. And that's seventy nine dollars a month. Um, currently, we are um, we are paying fifteen hundred dollars for HDIS, which we won't do once we um, this program is in place. And we are uh, paying for Quadex, which is the company that do our billing. Um, we're paying uh, thirteen hundred dollars for them. That's what we paid last year. Um, so in all in all, that would be about three thousand dollars savings if we go with that program. That will do it all one stop, um, up to date. We, you all heard about HIS, how antiquated it is, and it's not up to where we want it to be. So um, at this point, uh, like I said, we went through all the details here. Um, you know, and what's um, what's we gonna they gonna provide as part of the program. 
and before I ask for more, the total cost of the contract, it's going to be $9,936 um, and uh, paid in monthly installments of 828, the $749 plus the $79 for billing. Um, we talked to Chad a little bit. He manages some of the grant money that came for COVID, and I think we're going to be able to pay for at least half of it this first year um, from from one of the grants until we get our budget stabilized enough to be able to kind of include it uh, to, to be part of the budget. So the 13 and the 1500, whatever we're buying now, is that included in that or is that we're going to do it with it? That's part of what we're paying right now. Yeah. Um, that's going to that's okay. uh, we're going to we're not going to need those services. But it's going to be for those paid by grants or were they? No, a, those are paid by our operational. So, budget. so really we have 2800 plus. Half. That's correct. Okay. So um, I don't know, um, Shannon and Laura, if you have some feedback for the board so they can make a better decision, please speak up. Yeah, um, from my perspective, I've worked with eClinical Works in my clinical setting as a nurse practitioner. I mean, it was, you know, four or five years ago, but I remember it being very easy to use. I didn't have any issue with it. And really, from a cost standpoint, I thought it was going to cost the health department much more money um, mm -hmm. to get like an electronic medical record. But since we can go into a cohort with the different health departments, it really cut down how much it was going to cost. Um, just from what I personally remember talking to, like a pediatrician that I used to have who was in private practice, it cost her thirty to forty thousand dollars to have a singular like electronic medical record that she wasn't in a cohort with per year. And that was every single year. So when this came back to us and said nine thousand dollars, I was like kind of blown away. Um, you know, and I had that discussion with that pediatrician ten years ago. So um, I was really impressed with how you know. I guess, you know, this is going to be to the health department really is going to make our billing go better. It's going to make my job easier from a, a nurse practitioner standpoint and doing charts and doing notes um, and really getting what I'm doing in the mobile health clinic over to like other patients, primary care or, you know, specialties. It'll make this much more seamless than also get us up with the times mm -hmm. instead of doing paper charting and using the archaic billing method that we previously were. So, and then also like from a standpoint of vaccination, um, you know, going out to do vaccination clinics, what we're doing right now is making paper copies of driver's license and um, also insurance cards. E-Clinical Works has the capability of scanning those right in and it goes straight to the electronic medical record to the cloud. So we're not using, you know, those types of resources. So they'll save on manpower like hours and also on resources for, you know, printing things out and having papers all over the place. And it will just really make it easier. We probably spend more than that a year on paper. Oh, I bet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like oh, we use yeah. our staff's time and billing. Yes. Uh -huh. They. It's going to cut down on our staff's time on billing, not just Dan, but also for mm -hmm. CMH program. I mean, she spends hours billing, which, yes, we can recoup that cost in there, but this is going to make it so much more sufficient. And I'm sure we're going to catch things that yeah. we didn't mm -hmm. catch before. Mm -hmm. And yeah, even mm -hmm. with the price, I remember when I started in 2014 and we were looking, they had me look into different EMRs and yeah, they were anywhere from 30 to $60,000, yeah. the uh -huh. health department, you know, and that was eight years ago. So right. the biggest thing that Ottawa County had encouraged us to do is to do it all at once, yeah. import everything, mm -hmm. take the time and do mm -hmm. it. Their health commissioner had not done that at the time, so they still have quite a bit of paper because they are like merging their patients in as they see them or they had to manually do everything. Mm -hmm. So that was their big thing. They did say like for their outreach, your large clinics, some of that is still paper just because you don't have enough tablets to, mm -hmm. or if they can register ahead of time, then you can do that. But if it's like a walk-in type thing, there's still some, but that's seasonal for us. So overall, I think it's going to it's gonna help mm -hmm. a lot. I consider myself somewhat uh, technologically impaired. So uh, <laughs> I wanted to uh, see if there was any uh, issue with compatibility. No, we asked all those questions and they're going to be able to import everything over. They're familiar. The good thing is this company's worked with a lot of other health departments. Yeah. So they're very familiar with what we're working with and what needs to be done. And the plus side too, um, I'm sure Alexa will touch on it in her report, but we are seeing an influx of 
non-English speaking patients. So okay. through all departments, I think, especially with her program and clinic, um, unfortunately it doesn't have like a translation service as far as person to person, which we're working on, but it is able to any document that we upload in there, they are able to translate to the language that we want them to. So I think that's gonna come in oh, handy as well. So existing records would be scanned into the system. Is that how this goes? Then HDIS will be imported over. So I don't believe like our paper records we have now. A lot of our stuff is already scanned from a clinical side anyways. Everything gets scanned in. We have documents from like you'll see up front some of our filing cabinets that are like I think they're I don't remember what it's 1985 to I forget what year and we've gradually worked on scanning those in over the years so those might get scanned in as the patient what happens is a lot of times those are kids they come in for college things and then when we see them we'll scan that document in so everything that's scanned into our system now will get imported over to the it's it's a cloud-based um, program so we don't keep anything in here everything is secured in the cloud we can access it from anywhere mm -hmm. uh, we just have to have internet connection and that data migration is included in the cost so that initial data migration it's going to take a lot of effort on their part to you know um, bring over all the records we have already in the system and that's included in the cost too we made sure that this is included because that's cost a lot of money and even in the contract you know there's a clause saying if we don't if we don't get everything the first time because of you know the system is not working or it's our fault we'll have to pay for future imports so um the cost the cost is reasonable for for many reasons i guess one of them is being a cohort of uh, with other health departments paying for that program it's already um in place all they have to do is just give us access um and um uh, it, it's based on how many providers you have so since we have only one provider, I think it, the cost is really minimal to us. What about the training? I, I see where mm -hmm. I don't mention, does it mention the? They provide, yeah, I think it's on the first page. They uh, provide in-person training, remote training, and then um, Ottawa County mentioned this as well as the representative that they have with ECW University, and that's available at all times. So that'll be really nice even for new employees. If we get new employees, like, I mean, there's, she said there's trainings for so many different things. Like, I forget how many years they've had it now, but she said, you know, once you get in and you're starting to play with something, you go in and you're like, I don't know how to do that. They can go to this ECW University and kind of find the training for each thing. They give you access to those trainings yes, and videos down and anytime. Training. Okay. To begin with, yeah. It sounds like it's ease of use is very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Agreed. Yeah. Our recommendation is to approve it. So, okay. All right. Do we have a motion? So, second. second. Okay, we'll do a roll call on this one too. BJ? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Robin? Yes. Bill? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right. Staff reports. Start with green. Uh, okay, we're going to talk a little bit of financials here. Uh, I did try to print it, but it's um, smaller than ever. I think the the, the bottom line is uh, we're still on track. What we you know with our budget that's we approved last November, um, and um, this month, the month of September, uh, we brought in the three hundred twelve. Uh, twelve thousand two hundred sixty-three and two cents, and we've expensed four hundred forty-one thousand two hundred seventy-six and sixty-four cents. And if you look at the flip side, it's pretty consistent with what's been going on for the last seven years. And, you know, as far as um, our budget is going, we do um, we do expect that um, the last quarter will be lower on revenues, more on on expense side. Uh, bottom line, I look at the bigger picture here. Um, if we uh, we brought in three three million three million two hundred thirty six thousand two hundred eighteen and three cents, and so far we've expensed um, two million nine hundred thirty eight thousand six hundred forty two and forty three cents. 
So as long as we our expenses are less than our revenues, I think we're I'm expecting we'll end the year in the blank as well. Um, a lot of that delay in, in billing and stuff, that's because we use a third party to go bill for us. So with the with the e uh, EC, e clinical work, it's gonna it's gonna make it a lot faster. So that you guys will be able to kind of in real not in real time, but close to a real time, saying exactly how much we're billing and how much it's reflected in, in getting the income back. So that should should improve on the budgeting end as well. Any questions? All right. So. Um, this today we're going to do like a, a quick special report on the mosquito activity surveillance and uh, Kurt, the supervisor with the environmental health is going to uh, help us out to see what happened last, uh, <laughs> last season here. Good morning. Uh, this year was a lot like every other year. We do spoke to a lot of testing. Uh, Madeline Harrington was our seasonal vector control technician and Ryan Burks did a lot of the trapping and uh, of mosquitoes for surveillance. We send those to Ohio Department of Health, like usual, and test for West Nile virus. <clears throat> on top of that, then we focused some of our efforts onto the control of mosquitoes. Uh, they did a lot of catch basing. We'll get the numbers at the bottom, but they drove around and, and did the different communities, and, the, and then even in Finley did a lot of catch basins this year and did some treatment that prevent mosquitoes from, from uh, reaching adulthood and, and spreading disease. And then and additionally, we tried to focus more on education and outreach this year. I think the state's moving that way too because we want people to be empowered to be able to take care of their uh, themselves. Mosquitoes, uh, we do spraying as part of our control. It's not a, a great tool on a regular basis for, for various reasons and economically and just good practice. It only kills the mosquitoes that it hits that night and next day we have a whole new batch that way of hatch. So um, the outreach is done mainly through uh, with the help of Laura and Lisa at the mobile health clinic, handing out a lot of mosquito repellents and, and things like that that we've obtained from the, the grant money that we had this year from the EPA grant, which was a great tool and a great talking point for people. Uh, <clears throat> and, and consults with the office. People will call in and have questions about, you know, I've seen a lot of mosquitoes. How do I, you know, how do I take care of it? Or if they have a concern about their neighbor, you know, down the street that has standing water and trying to explain to them how this can affect you more locally because mosquitoes don't travel that far and, and what you can do to protect yourself by you know the different measures. So a uh, good amount of manpower went into that. Uh, this th a little map here shows the kind of distribution of where we set our traps this year. Throughout the county, we, every township gets, gets some, some traps set and, and, and quite a few in Finley. And again, based on population and, and risk, you know, we kind of want to <clears throat> set the traps where we think we're going to find mosquitoes but also where there's people involved because on um, the cornfield we'll, yeah, we'll probably find a lot of mosquitoes but if there's nobody within a mile it doesn't give us good data um, the data trapping is good locally but it's also used um, i guess on a statewide basis is better representation of what the activity is because even though we set in 3,700 mosquitoes the state tested maybe 100,000 and gives you a better picture of you know, even though we had two traps one week, maybe it wasn't just an anomaly and it's not really that bad yet or, or how that bigger picture gives you that better representation. So just the activity, just the just kind of the numbers, we said 133 traps this year. Good number was at about where we're at usually. Uh, we had we were blessed with the same person for four years who had a routine and we had to do some training and onboarding this year. So we did good though as far as numbers of traps that Mosquitoes, you know, over 3,000, over 3,700 actually. And we had nine positive West Nile um, pools that were tested. Uh, those come typically later in the year, you know, August is when we start to see that activity. Uh, catch basins, they did 1,288 catch basins this year, which was, a, I believe, an all time record high for us, which was <laughs> great. We, uh, and that's, that's not always just the once over either, because sometimes we have some products that last for longer. So they went back and did some other products through the summer when we start seeing that standing water. Because <clears throat> if we put it in the spring, a lot of water can wash it away in the rain. So we want to do it during the summer activity. Uh, the mosquito repellents distributed 405. It doesn't include kind of like your wipes. They have out like um, mosquito repellent wipes and sprays that do a great job. And, and then even the 
mosquito bracelets, 780, which is a very popular product with the kids. They like to put those on in <laughs> different colors. And it's good messaging. And then uh, the mosquito dumps we give to, we have some products that the homeowners can use themselves if they have bird baths, gutters that they want to try to treat to keep mosquitoes from growing. So uh, we did give out 30 of those this year. Um, I, every year is hard to gauge of how the mosquito activity is kind of by the feel of the phone calls that come in. It didn't feel like we had a lot of calls this year and it wasn't that rush in the spring of like, I need to go get something from the health department. So I guess that's a good thing, but in, as far as West Nile virus, it, on the state trend, it was pretty typical year. It wasn't anything too extraordinary or anything too, you know, light on that end of it. But it was a pretty good year, I think. And like I said, Ryan and, and Mal did a great job and, and Lisa and Lord did a great job representing us at the farmers markets and the different activities, the different festivals they did to kind of give a product out to the, get it out into the hands of the people. So that's, that's my short report, if you have any questions. Is, is the uh, map shading uh, significant? It is not. That's just the kind of typical the wall map, the big map the engineer has. That's kind of the same color scheme they use. So, for example, while would the top row with eleven traps in Washington and twelve in Allen and only three in Cass? What did what does that mean to any of us? That's the number of the shading or just not the number of traps? Yeah. Number of traps. Sure, that's just the location. And, and a lot of that's based on opportunity of where we set our traps in public locations. We don't want to set them on private property because we prefer, we need you know their permission and and just the, the aspect of hopefully getting them back the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what's going to happen if you don't you know, put them in a good spot. So sure. Um, I know Washington has some like reservoirs and things like that, and we're starting to get a more population towards Fostoria. Okay. So we, we, we don't go into Fostoria, but uh, Van Buren State Parks and Van Buren has some other good places there and uh, good parks that we can use. And, and we had some activity or some requests for traps and from their mayor just saying, hey, we had some concern last year. Can we find a spot this year? So we set a couple extra up that way this year. Yes, I know I should know this already, but what is a mosquito dump? Uh, we use that term kind of a, as a, a public. It's a, just a treatment for the water. It, it, once the mosquitoes lay their eggs in the water, it prevents them from reaching adulthood. So the, the eggs will hatch, larvae will come out, and then they just don't reach adulthood to go and, and actually bite anybody. Or standing water. Like standing if water, have, yeah. If you have a pond or something like that, that you, you know, a lot of um, residents that live. Do we have any West Nile cases in people? Human cases in Hancock County? I don't believe. I don't, nothing that I heard. I know this trickle went through the year, but no. nothing has been announced to us. Just Would one you consider this a uh, uh, high year, low year, or dry year, wet year? Or, or like mosquito activity or what? Yeah, anything. I said yeah, mosquito well, activity mosquito. is really hard to test because we only set you know, four or five traps a night throughout the county. I kind of base it on number of calls we get, and it, it, we didn't get that influx that we normally see. So maybe a little lower year. Um, again, it's it's kind of a rough guess because some people just don't call, even if they have a lot of mosquitoes. But um, it didn't seem like a high year for activity. Uh, and as far as West Nile, um, locally, we always have positive traps toward the end of the year. Um, it's not unusual, but on a statewide level, they they graph um, as far as their um, infectious rate of the statewide traps and it was between they, they, they try to give you years that were pretty similar and it was I from what I could tell between two years that were pretty typical it wasn't anything I think it was 2012 or 16 was a high year for them and they kind of show that graph on the same line and we weren't near that so um, it was I guess a good year I said no human cases is, is a good year for us and uh, the surveillance portion is is a great tool to help us and the state kind of see you know, we, we always do messaging and that part of our outreach, we have electronic billboards and we do uh, social media posts, uh, all kinds of good messaging. Even the courier ran a couple of good ads this summer, or good stories this summer. Um, messaging still the same, West Final Virus is here. We know it's here, just how to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. Just one question, yeah. maybe to have the board understand a little better, how how this all this surveillance will, um, will feed into making decisions on spraying? Sure. Yeah. So we, we do the, we do use the West Nile positives uh, pools when we get those results. Sometimes they were a little backlog. The summer might be a week or two after we send them in. 
we do use that for focused targeting spraying and, and maybe even some education and enforcement if or not enforcement um catch basin treatment i should say so if we do see for instance this year we did have a positive that was um a landing i think in the or out in the middle of the country well there wasn't a huge population base there to to say well maybe we need to spray because out in the cap on the countryside you know maybe five houses were within that, that, that area okay. but if we had a positive in, in a populated area and a couple in the villages and some finley then we made sure we had a, a spraying event after uh, again it's not a great tool to say this is a gonna kill all the mosquitoes but it may knock them down a little bit to help just the overall population and and even then we if we see a positive we, we may say well, when was the last time we did the catch basins in that area well that product's supposedly still good but we won't hurt us to put another application so just kind of that 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 tool to find out where we need to focus some of our efforts and just to intervene i we've used that data in the past so for example we know seems like every year we always get a positive in a particular area. So we've went ahead and we have vamped up of treating the catch basins in that area, trying to get ahead of it, preventive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we yeah we have our, our typical sit areas where we know where water stands and, and, and where we get positive mosquitoes. And again, it's, it's one test, one trap, and it's probably a bigger issue than just that one location. But we use that kind of year to year trend to try to figure out where do we focus beginning of the year before we yeah we don't wait until we have a problem we try to we have we send them out in spring to do the catch basins and then that helps for a month or two and then we get it again in summer to make sure they're still being effective but as much as valuable the state surveillance is i think it's really important that we do our part of it because mosquitoes you know unless they hitchhike they don't they don't fly too far so it's a neighborhood problem it is and that's why um you know we set up Traps in different in different areas where population is, so we can kind of gauge exactly what's going on in that local locality. I think that helps a lot with the with the with the prevention part of it. Kudos to Kurt and his team. Uh, I think they've done a great job through the years, and this year is just uh, keeps getting better. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Kareem, do you think we ought to hold this for next month? Let's get down. Um. Right. Yeah. There's several other reports. It doesn't make a difference. We'll, uh, we'll look for like if you have time. I think if sure. Yes. I don't know if the board needs to be A couple things just from COVID is settled down. I think we're for that. We haven't seen any thoughts. Um, Green asked me if I would I say something about this, what we're doing with the community health plan. So I may make this brief. This what I'm going to talk about is, is really not about content. It's more about what we've been trying to do as far as structure, organization, uh, when individuals act. What, what's the community plan? And that includes not just public health and not just the healthcare system, but the Atomist board, et cetera. Um, this is something we've been using Gary Bryce on. We've been doing, um, we're on the addiction task force, the medical section of it. And so we started out, we had a big planning retreat <clears throat> um, about a month ago where there were some 30 individuals about what are we doing with opioids addiction and things like that. And we thought it would be a good idea at that time to review our mission, vision and values for that part of this in addition to what were the guiding principles. So that's that's what this document is. And it's somewhat of a duplication, but I'll. I'll go through this so you can just think about it. Um, again, it's not so much content. So we decided that our vision at a high level was we want to be the healthiest county in Ohio. And there's lots of metrics around that. We could spend an hour talking about that. But then our guiding principles, again, those are down here, our mission, vision, and values as we look at this again from the community standpoint. And how do we make that determination? Well, there's surveys. We've done the community health needs assessment that we've talked about, and we're still in the process of working through that. We've had two meetings. We have two more before we come out with this CHIP plan, the community health improvement plan. The other thing is the, is the social determinants. And this comes from, and I should have put this, it's on here. That, that's what the collaboratives, if you remember, when the United Way four or five years ago had several different groups that came up with things we needed to do in the community that really are social determinants. And, and when I use the word social determinant, this is what affects your health. 
So transportation affects your health, poverty affects your health, housing, nutrition, all of those things. Well, they're still being looked at and Kareem can comment on. These are the collaboratives that are up here and there's another committee and that's chaired by Kathy Fell, which has from the university that has the foundation on it, the um, um, United Way, uh, Myron, my boss sits on it. There's several individuals that are looking about how these collaboratives work. And they've decided that we ought to try to put all these things together too and come up with some kind of a plan. Well, those, those collaboratives are still working. Uh, one of those is raise the bar. Some of you may be involved in that. And this is back to, okay, what are we doing about economic development, which is all part of, again, healthiest county in Ohio. So with that being said, we're in the process of making the community health plans. And what's gonna come out of that, again, structurally, is the Be Healthy Now. That's what we're doing over here with public health and primarily the hospital. There's other groups, the YMCA, uh, 50 North, there's a lot of other groups, but our responsibility and, and the responsibility here is that public health has a requirement that we need a plan. We have a regulatory, now talking about public health, so does Blanchard Valley Health System. We have an IRS 990 that we have to, so we, we are responsible to do some things. Everyone else here, uh, in some form or another, but they don't have the, the compliance with the federal government and the Ohio government. So what's coming out of Be Healthy Now? And the three things that are here is what we think the priorities are going to be, are going to be related to healthy behavior. We're working at the hospital level with diabetes, what we've done before. Some of that is the mobile health clinic, the glucose, et cetera. We've been working together with diabetes and obesity. So one of, as you can see, the priorities, one's be healthy behaviors. The other one is mental health. Now, um, under mental health, you've got the behavioral health. Mental health has come up with all kinds of things. Again, there's a lot of content under that. And we continue to see the problem with addiction. That's what Gary and I, so you can draw a big bucket around it. What we felt we needed to have the same mission, vision, values, et cetera, in this group, and then how do we differentiate or what do we need to do differently for this group as to what we would be doing for the entire community. And we're in the process of, and this would be for everything, what are our strategies going to be to improve this? What are the action plans underneath of that? And then what are the goals or metrics that we're looking at? So we're trying to formalize this. We were in the process of doing that. Kareem had a meeting. We met every month very specific. These are the things that we wanted to do. And then COVID hit, which made it really difficult to meet to be able to do a lot of things. But I think we had it pretty well formalized, that strategy, action plans, and, and things here. The third thing that's the priority that we've already talked about is workforce, um, especially in this area over here. There just aren't enough counselors. We don't have people that are able to do anything with mental health in all kinds of ways. So one of the strategies to be the healthiest county in Ohio is we've got to have a workforce. And I think we are going to be talking, as we already talked about today, reaching out. We need to we need to do a lot of training. We need to be a learning community of these individuals coming in. So that's at the high level of what we're trying to come up with. We will be reporting this out. Uh, I'm probably first of December, maybe. Yes. I don't know how you've gone about doing that. December, I think the first week of December. It has to be approved or what? Anything you want to add to that? No, I think that was a great presentation. Yeah, and it's just, no, it's just the structure of the things. Um, the big thing is like any organization, once you get all this data back, how do you prioritize what you want to do? And that's what we're in the process. Bill? When you had the uh, shortage of addiction uh, sir, or mentioned, is that anything that the University of Findlay or Owens can help with that problem? Yes, absolutely. And that is the process. A, a couple, of, let me let me answer that a little. One of the guiding principles of the community is we've got to collaborate. I mean, I, I'm going to speak that from the hospital. We can't, we can't do anything specifically about nutrition or about transportation we can help with. We've got to collaborate everywhere. I think we've developed a really good relationship with public health, we switching hats from the hospital, from the healthcare system, 
but the same thing with the whole education <laughs> process. One of the interesting things about I'm on the board at the university is how much there is interaction with high schools. Uh, there's lots of, and maybe some of you grandkids or kids that are taking college classes and getting them involved <laughs> in these kind of things, either community activities, internships, or whatever. So we're working with the university. The university's working with Owens. If BJ were here, there's lots of things we're trying to do specifically with nursing. But I think you're going to see at a level what Kareem talked about. We're going to have internships for accountants, for all kinds of things as we try to develop those people. And part of that is purely for us. I mean, this is about recruiting and retention, getting someone out and being able to keep them in the community. There's a lot of a lot of exodus from Northwest Ohio after they've been trained. Just that's in general about what happens. So those are strategies yeah. that we're going to be looking at. Yep. The uh, I, I know just watching uh, some of the ads on TV in Lucas County, particularly, um, you know, several institutions are uh, running ads for addiction training and yes, and and all that. That was what made me think of that question. No, no, it's, it, well, it's a great point. And um, there's actually a really neat program to the University Assembly where they offer, I don't believe it's a minor or a short course in addiction itself. I know like Jen Loera that works with the mom's recovery program. She's taken that and it's very interesting just on how those drugs work in the brain and some approaches. I think again, and this now this is personal opinion. This is kind of is that I, I do think that it's really valuable for students to have some hands on experience before they graduate. That's my my and, and that, that sort of thing. And plus, I think it helps us too. So those are things. And the University here in Finley has really been looking business school about how they can get people out again, as Kareem said, get them in. Now, it does take as someone said, I don't want to belabor this, but I had a lot of students I'm sure you did. It takes a lot of time to have a student with you. Exactly. I mean, well, <laughs> relatively, I mean, it's not that, but I can't be nearly as quick. So that's mm -hmm. part of talking to everyone. You have to, you know, you have to allocate mm -hmm. some time. Are there any other uh, areas that we're really deficient in to be the healthiest county in Ohio? That's a that's a great question. And um, as you look, we're the healthiest county in Ohio. Kareem, are we on a time frame? You know, I don't like the. No, 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 no. Good. Uh, Those are good questions. So, well, the healthiest county in Ohio comes out of what's the Ohio Health Institute policy of, of in, in Columbus. And inside that, there's like 144 different questions. And inside of those, are a lot of them have to do with individual behavior. Some of them have to do with access to care. Can you get in to see someone? But then they also go into these other social determinants. So there's questions about transportation. There's questions about educational level. There's questions about nutrition. Did you, were you able to eat or those kind of things? And so as you look at all of those, that's what brings everybody together about what you're doing. Um, I can't even answer, and uh, Kareem and I talked a little bit about this. There's a question about air, air, air quality. And now that was one, I don't even know where the data comes from, but somebody's got the data at the federal level of, of Hancock County about a lot of these things. And I think during the next three years, we'll start to look at those to answer your question. I'm not saying at all we have a problem with water or with air or with anything. I just don't know the answer to that because I think most of us think of health is are you healthy? Mm -hmm. you know, heart attack or are you walking around or whatever? But one of the one of the other groups that we really want to pull into this, especially in this community, is the faith based community. Uh, one about what they're doing, um, the, the uh, backyards pop projects, community belongingness, connectedness, long, Loneliness, some people say, is the number one. Once you get to be my age, once you get to be 65, that that may be the biggest problem we've got related social determinants. So I, I'm rambling a little bit, but it's a great question, Bill. And I think as we look at those things, what can everyone in the community, guiding principle, everybody can help each other of what we need to do, including organizations and like public health? That's good. 
So we'll we'll bring back we'll be bringing back some of these. And uh, so if anybody has any comments, because right now we're we're really working on this structure. So we don't want to duplicate things. We want to come up with things that. And your question, Bill, what are the things we really need to look at? Thanks, Green. Cool. Oh, thank you, Don. That was great. Thanks, All right. Let me just make time here of the, our leaders here. Go ahead, Laura. Bye, Max. All right. Yeah. So with the mobile health clinic this last month, we've been really busy doing getting mobile clinic out and about. So we've done six free events. So going out to like the county employees um, is coming up. And then we went out to the city of Finley employees doing screenings with point of care. So cholesterol checks, blood sugar checks, um, A1C checks as well. We've also went out to the north and just some other areas doing screening events. So through those screening events, I think it also gives people a perspective of, okay, we think we're healthy, but this is actually where our health is actually at. So we've done those. And then we've also went to some other outreach events like going to Mount Cory for a parade and the Van Buren Festival. So we've done seven of those. And we've also done two vaccination uh, clinics with the mobile health clinic. So we went out to Doherty Plaza to do city of Finley vaccinations and also over there to do county uh, vaccinations too. So we also have on a recurring schedule going out to the city mission every single Thursday. Uh, we had a ribbon cutting with the city of uh, or the Ooh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. There you go, the Chamber of Commerce, and then the city mission as well yesterday. Mm -hmm. So that'll be a really good collaborative for us. Um, and then we're going out to the Hope House every third Tuesday of the month. So we're looking to gain more of those kind of recurring, you know, um, schedules, but we're really excited to get out in the community. So. Question. Mm -hmm. um, I know last month there was some concern about whether the mobile health clinic would be going to jail or the... Uh, Veterans, and whether there's uh, another avenue to treat them at either place. Yeah, I have not reached out to any jails. I think that the jails will probably end up staying kind of in their own sector because I know that they do have their own kind of health care there. Um, with veteran services, though, we are going out to do it like an employee uh, screening event. Um, but then I think also I want to talk with. Um, I think her first name is Nicole. I can't remember her last name. I got her. There you go. I say I got her contact from um, a silent watch event that we went to. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to reach out to her and see if we can do some sort of screening event for those, um, you know, veterans that come into the um, Veterans Association. So that's kind of where we're at, where we're at on that standpoint. And I saw you in Dorney Plant. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. I saw the vehicle. Oh, yeah. Stop and say hi. Not I, you know, a distance off. Yeah. Highly visible. Yes, it is. Yep. <laughs> we're trying to make sure it's visible when we're out and about, too. So at the city mission, we're pulling right up front so people can see that we're out yeah. there. You know, make sure all the, you know, uh, residents of the city mission know that we're there as well. So. Good. Good job. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? Great. Thank you very yeah. much. All right, Chad. Budgetary updates. Um, we received information last month that uh, the workforce development grant is being extended by uh, four years. We're going to be doing that from 23 fiscal year 23, starting in uh, July of, the, of next year through uh, June of 2027, which is good because that will mean we'll continue to fund the communications position as well as uh, just. Um, came to light today with the BGSU opportunity. There may be funding there uh, within those grants to possibly pay uh, those interns. So, you know, more to come, but that's that's just some things that are coming up. Yesterday we had a funders call with the Adams board regarding our SOAR project, or formerly known as SOAR, the state opioid response. Now formally, or now changed to the state opioid and stimulant. Grant. They are that's going to be funding Brittany's position. The reason for the call was they were discussing allocations. Obviously, the state, the issue being you know, there's a you know a gum up with the funding coming from the federal to the state to us, and they're in the same boat right now because the money that they have been allocated is is they're waiting on the carryover money. So more to come on that, but we're going to still be able to fund. I think the the positions there, it's just going to trick the money's going to trick one a little slower. That's you know, name of the game right now. 
the final update I wanted to give you, uh, and we'll be able to report more next month because we'll have probably the investigation wrapped up, but we, you probably saw it in the paper that there was a voluntary recall by a local business uh, that was operating as a cottage business, but they, uh, they had sold some products to some of our retail establishments here in Finley, as well as in Putnam County that we had some preliminary, preliminary results back that some of the product as well as samples were positive for salmonella. So we're still working through that investigation. So more to come next month, but just wanted to make you aware of that situation. And we had four cases here in Hancock County and one in Allen County and um, Hannah, uh, Chad and uh, uh, Jane from our uh, disease nurse really worked hard with Dr. Toast and Dr. Ethan Sami on identifying some of those cases. And I think we, we our response was really quick and swift where we uh, we sent our environmental health ID just went out and, and pulled the products off the shelves. So I think we're proud of how that team yeah. worked together really quick to kind of contain all that. And it all hit at on a Friday afternoon. So it was uh, it never fails. Some sort of supplier issue. Yeah. It's 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 the yes, the supply issue. So. Um, we'll have our report, and once we have the reports, I think my plan and Chad's plan is to um, bring in um, Hannah here and kind of talk about that. It, it was interesting investigation, so maybe next next month we'll talk about it more once we have more answers. So, do we have very much control over this cottage industry? No. We'll go into their homes and inspect. No. That's <laughs> yeah. why environment. They don't want to. Don't want you to know. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that those are provisions in the law in Ohio and Department of Agriculture worked closely with Heidi and, and the EH team as well on that and with us. So I think it was it was a good kind of um okay warning here. Let's let's be careful on, on how we cook stuff at home and sell them. Um I just wanna um I want the board to recognize Chad's effort in helping us with all you know keeping the budgets of the grants and help us leverage some of that money. Um, and you know, uh, make use of it every everywhere else. And um, I know Shannon had to leave at nine uh, because she had an appointment. But I think um, uh, Alexa's gonna do yep. a little bit of her She gave me her notes, so I'll come up oh, here. Sorry. That way, I don't have to read to you guys. All right, sounds good. Um, she said CMH is doing great. There's been no changes within that program. Um, as far as school nursing goes, they're working on the immunization compliance reports. So those have been submitted and overall kindergarten looks really great, um, but there's still a struggle for the seventh and 12th graders as far as compliance goes. So that's referring to the four schools that that school nursing program serves. So Van Loo, Macomb, Arcadia and Liberty Benton. And she'll report back once the final results are available. Communicable diseases status quo. Um, vaccine clinics have been extremely busy this month. Um, there's been great turnouts for both flu and COVID mm -hmm. boosters. She's suspecting that our numbers are going to be higher just because a lot of people really took advantage of if they were here for their COVID booster, they went ahead and got their flu mm -hmm. shot. Maybe normally they would have gotten it at Kroger while they were grocery shopping or et cetera. So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see, but I know firsthand we have moved a lot of vaccine. Um, the routine vaccinations are starting to catch up with previous years. Um, still have some work to do, but numbers are looking better than they have in the last six months. Good. I just want to add one thing. That was a great report. Thank you, Alexa. Um, we did reach out like we do every every year. We reach out to the townships where most of the populations are, you know, Liberty and um, and Marion Township. I think so far Marion Township took us to task, and we did a big um, big drive-through clinic for flu and COVID. There, it was very successful. Um, you know, we had the sheriff, you know, directing traffic again. Usually, the beginning of, of those clinics are really uh, tough, but I think our staff is doing a great job. Um, and uh, not only the nurses that reports to um, um, to Shannon, but some of the nurses who reports to Alexa as well. They were they all work as a team. We got some environmental help with registration and stuff. And the biggest help was from our medical reserve corps, uh, which Karen uh, volunteered uh, almost on a weekly basis to come. Great here. response. I've been really good. Yes. Yeah, I think this this year our push for the flu and the COVID. Um, uh, 
booster at the same time. I think that should help the numbers and we should have better numbers next year. Next Is that month. a PR thing that should be put in the newspaper? I think we did. We did put that Marion Township in the newspaper. Well, Mary, actually, Marion Township did uh, put a press release out um, uh, mentioning the the and advertising for the for the uh, for the actual clinic. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, all of our clinics went. So we have been announcing regularly um, on social media and. Well, I guess what I was getting at is the the, yeah, the percentage in if there's an increase or something positive that you could encourage more people to get vaccinated. I guess that's. Well, once those right. numbers are final, probably we will, uh, but that's going to take us probably into November or December until okay. we, we tally right. everything up. But yeah, that's just a good idea. CDC does have a, a, a campaign that's rolling out in November for vaccinations across the board, and we I have that ready to go. So it will air, it'll go out around Thanksgiving um, just to, you know, kind of boost numbers. I'll find I'll probably know in a couple of weeks like how the majority of the public feels about that. Most people don't have a negative connotation. They just want to get their vaccinations when they want to. They yeah. don't want to be told when to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We learned that. And are we we're out of Moderna? Uh, I don't know if they ordered some more. Uh, we did order some more. It's been limited in what we can order, but last I heard, we're getting shipments of 200. Oh, good. So, yeah. We had a lot of requests for Moderna, and, and people were cooperative. They they did take the Pfizer. If, it's when definitely we more popular. We had a mm -hmm. lot of requests for the high dose, um, and we ran out of that, and I guess the state Yes. Anymore? Yeah, I think they are, they, but they're trickling, you know, the, oh. those orders are trickling, you know, for whatever they have, they will send our way. Um, the problem with the Moderna is I think they were caught off guard by the FDA approving that booster rate yeah. quick. Uh, Pfizer was ready, they were not, and I think that's kind of the free market type of thing, but uh, but I agree, because we started with Moderna a couple of years ago, if you all remember, and a lot of our population, especially the older population who took the Moderna first, wanted to continue with the Moderna, mm -hmm. um, for as much as they, you know, that all the experts are saying that there's no difference, but, but it's a preference, and um, uh, like you said, a lot of people, after talking to them, and kind of, um, they, they agreed to take the Pfizer, but uh, but that's something we we are ordering Moderna as they become available to us uh, because the demand for it is, is more than mm -hmm. Pfizer because we started with Moderna here. I've heard a lot of positive comments from the community about the ease of getting their vaccinations here. Yes, and they're yes. I think they're spreading the word. Mm -hmm. It's so mm -hmm. much simpler. We just drive up, we walk in, and mm -hmm. we're not waiting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all Great. staff will try our best to keep the lines moving. I mean the the. Uh, the volunteers are doing a great job. Again, all all health department, you know, staff will just all hands on deck when we have a clinic yeah. and we're busy. Yeah. That's I really think. a testament to the MRC volunteers because, yeah. you know, we're all back to our normal jobs. <laughs> we're still having regular clinics during those times and you guys this is helping a lot. And the staff, they're, they're not giving themselves enough. <laughs> we were at 50 North. They were coming right and left at us and they were giving us the the syringes as fast as we could give the shots. Yeah. That was a great event. That was yeah. Great assembly line. <laughs> <laughs> they got it down to a science though. They do. <laughs> I would simply say that, you know, my wife and I got uh, came here and got the shots and it was very user friendly until we got to shots. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't come to me. <laughs> sit down for a week, right? <laughs> I'll give you the complaint. I've been surprised that people want both of them because I'm a chicken. I only take one at a time. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, very good. Um, how about your report? Yes, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, so starting with the numbers, once again, it does look like our visits are down. However, just to comment on the diversity of the clients that we are getting, we are having longer visits. Um, more high quality visits, a lot of referrals during our visits. So 
one thing I really want to focus on in this next year is a lot of the referrals that we are getting for these potentially very complicated families are we're getting the referrals and the families are already a mess. So really my goal is to get with some community members to hopefully get referrals to the program before, you know, mom's ending up in the ER with sick babies or before domestic violence is happening within the home and the children are removed. So that's kind of my goal moving forward. I know it's not always something that's plausible, but um, we, we have a total of six families right now in our caseload that do not speak English at all. Mm -hmm. So we're using a translation service, but they're very lengthy visits and sometimes getting to the root of their needs can be very difficult. Um, what language are they speaking? Uh, it, it just varies. We have Portuguese, we have Spanish, we have a lot of families that are bilingual. And so they're reaching out for assistance because they're noticing some delays in their children as far as communication goes, which is really, really common when they're trying to teach that child more than one language. So it's just been very interesting, but immigration has become something we've really had to read up on and learn the rules and, you know, where can they turn to for help when they, they have those issues. So just very very complicated cases but it's just a variety mostly spanish some portuguese haitian creole is is getting more common as well yes um so that kind of speaks to the numbers a little bit we had a great successful event at the wick drive-through baby shower so that was aimed toward pregnant moms we ended up with 17 referrals at that event so our wait list is climbing again i haven't been able to reach out to all those moms yet um, but things are looking great for Hancock County as far as program sustainability. There's going to be a, an event in Fostoria in December that will hopefully help us with those Wood County slots. So we're up to five out of 10. We're getting there slowly, but surely. Um, hopefully that will help get the rest of the way there. Um, group will be next week so that we can kind of bounce off of Halloween. The Finley Digital Academy group is taking place. It's not taking off like it did last year. There's a total of eight um, moms and kiddos that Amber would like to get involved with that group. However, they just haven't been attending. So we had two that attended this past week and we've kind of started to think about restructuring our program a little bit and making it less formal and less scary for them. So we think for November and December, especially since those are our bigger groups for our traditional program, we thought about just inviting them to our Santa Claus program or our Thanksgiving dinner program, letting them invite a friend. And the school's been very supportive, letting them just write up a brief paragraph of what they learned and they still get school credit for that. So we're taking a new approach until, until we get them a little bit more familiar with the program. And the last thing that I want to mention is that handbags that help the proposal that I submitted regarding providing transportation to the groups has taken off and they want a full proposal. So I'm working on that right now. It will be due November 7th and then Cheryl and I are working on a presentation the week after that. Um, to get some data as far as who would attend groups, I have put together a survey using a QR code that we're distributing to all of our families. And I included those three questions for you guys, just to kind of give us a little bit more background on who would attend play groups if we had transportation and then kind of going back to the cost of that, that grant. So in-town trips are going to be a little bit cheaper as far as that HATS contract goes. But if we have to travel outside of Finley limits, it it's about $2.50 a mile. So we'll need to account for that as we put that full request together. So, so far the data supporting that transportation is definitely greatly needed. I plan to collect that data for about another week and I'll report back to you guys next week on what that final proposal looks like. And then finally, I am working on our quality improvement process through parents as teachers. It's a six month long process and we do it every five years. So that's through our curriculum and there's 81 total measures that I'll report back on. So <laughs> I will be a busy bee. <laughs> Just want to add to the handbags that help projects that Alexa um, is working on. 
I think this is a great um, example of what Dr. Coase presented uh, for the coalitions working together. So that's transportation, helping public health, mm -hmm. helping the families get the services they need, and helping them, uh, you know, graduate from that program. I think this is this is a great example of how coalitions are going to be working together. So um, does that, the health department need to think about uh, employing a translator? We did um, part of the discussion as we are, uh, you know, uh, uh, presented with those challenges. Um, a translator for usually, if you employ somebody, it will be a few languages. It won't be that variety. Mm -hmm. And the languages that Alexa is reporting on that we're seeing lately here are not your traditional Spanish. Mm -hmm. You know uh, that that people need help with. So um, there's programs and apps that that will do FaceTime translating for medical. Uh, purposes, so they're HIPAA compliant. Where and we're looking into kind of once we get that e EMR going, probably see what what they have in there. They don't have the translation part, just for documents. But we're looking at an app where we will have an iPad, probably with Alexa uh, with Alexa staff. They will tap on that app and say, "I need translator for Portuguese," and then they will get them on the line and face to face it will be translation that way. Luckily, right now we have an app that the Ohio Department of Health provides our program with that just doesn't always transfer over to the other programs within our health department. So we do have a way to communicate and that does include face to face like we can do a Zoom call. That way they can see the translator and they can see the client as well. However, the problem we're running into is there's so many different dialects of language. It's well, that's what I was. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that might be a, challenge, be a simple yeah. solution, right? Do we have to pay for that survey? Yeah, probably yes. I don't know how much that we're still researching of who provides it and what's the terms of it. Um, but once we're ready, we'll bring it to the board as well. I think it's going to be needed moving forward. Yeah. Um, that's our. Um, I think the hospital used some similar. Right. Um, but um, but it's an app and you pay per per session. Right. Even before I retired, we were not Sorry. able to get in person translators and so we went to uh, yep. we might be able to help um, with that sure just, just to give you some perfect information yeah. uh, to find out i don't know who it is but karen's right it was through um um customer service before i think Nancy yeah, but Proctor. nancy's retired so oh well I'll whoever find it. took over <laughs> yeah. Nancy Proctor, in person can be very retired? difficult though too depending on a, we have families that cancel their visits, and B, where are these visits taking place? You know, I don't want to take a translator in person to the Hotel 8 either. Yeah. It's, um, we have to look at it, you know, collectively and kind of figure out the best way to do it. All right, any other questions for Alexa? All right, thank you, Alexa. I see you're Lindsay, your I'm going to just be very quick because you're starting to lose quorum and you need I to know. <laughs> Um, my report's attached. I think there you've heard me speak a lot this morning already, along with Kurt. So you can kind of see where staff has been here, been moving here these last few months. Um, I'll, I'd like to give a shout out to Craig Krajewski. He's been keeping the sewage program running since we're down that staff sanitarium. And this is our busy time of the year because everybody's trying to get that last push since we have that. Um, October 31st deadline for installation because we want to be able to make sure we got good soils to install those. So Craig has been pushing through and getting it done for us. And I greatly appreciate all of his help for us through that. Um, like I said, or is attached. Any questions? Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Uh, Craig is uh, under the weather today, and I told him to stay out of here. So, um, so he's uh, he's been working on multiple projects, just maintaining our uh, IT infrastructure. Um, we did uh, purchase new copier that he was very involved in, kind of uh, uh, doing testing on the software we're gonna use. Um, there's a lot of opportunities with that copier. We use, we've been leasing copiers for the last um, six years since the merger. Um, but I think uh, this year they um, uh, we found some money and some of the grants for us to purchase that up front, and we'll just pay pay maintenance uh, service fee going forward. Um, it has a lot more cap capabilities as far as printing faster, um, as far as keep tracking. So um, if you know uh, you have your ID, you print some on the printer. It won't print until you're at the printer and you put your ID. 
This way, it's going to help us with when we cost for the different projects and different grants and different programs, we'll be able to say, OK, we're going to charge Alexa a million dollars because she printed um, too much, um, um, so on and so forth. <laughs> so uh, so we'll be able to kind of have a better idea of the cost of each and every program. And I think this is uh, this is going to help us move forward too, um, with the with the uh, moving into electronic documentation projects as well. Uh, this copier is, is going to help us as well. So, uh, but has been, uh, you know, uh, maintaining the stuff that we have already. Uh, we told him that uh, he bought a lot of toys the last couple of years. He needs to slow down next year because uh, a lot <laughs> of that, a lot of that grant money is going to be drying up probably next year. Um, you know, as we move away from COVID. But I think we're we're in a good position as far as IT um, and data management part. So we're good. Um, as far as my uh, my report, um, I've been working a lot um, trying to kind of navigate some of the agreements and playing lawyers on TV. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I've been uh, I've been working um, you know with that. We work uh, we're working hard with Dr. Coase on the on the chip and coming up with the priorities. We have our last meeting uh, third meeting next week and last meeting the first week of December. Uh, by that last, by that fourth meeting, we should have kind of an idea what the plan is going to look like. Uh, Dr. Kosa and him working on the structure. We're going to put it together here and uh, and come up you know, with a good way moving forward and how to report to the community what progress we've made on becoming the healthiest community on the different metrics we, we, we're going to choose to do. Um, you know, the hospital council is, is helping us with that. Uh, that's part of the contract. Um, and um, uh, we have a, a, a huge coalition of partners in the community, ADMAS, um, the foundation, the United Way, the YMCA, um, the transportation, every little um, you know, uh, service we have here in town, they're on the table. And I think it's been great discussions here moving forward and on how we're going to, what we're struggling with this time around is reporting back. And Dr. Post, you know, um, uh, always struggled reporting back to his board, you know, at the hospital. I, I'm struggling reporting back what kind of progress we've made on those goals because no, but it's hard when you have coalition that have multiple governance. Mm -hmm. uh, like I cannot control what the hospital is doing with their goals. I cannot control what, uh, what uh, transportation mm -hmm. is doing. So I think, um, and that will bring me into the next um, uh, item on our uh, thing, it's personnel. If you all remember, Jessica Shrake is the CDC Foundation um, um, epidemiologist that was assigned to us and paid for by the CDC. Um, her contract expired on the 15th of October, and um, I did um, I did sit down with the chat a little bit and told them, can you find me some money with the workforce development um, fund here that we got uh, to keep her for a little longer so she can help us with a dashboard, uh, with crunching some numbers and put for the whole community on that project a way to us to give output, not only to the structure that Dr. Coase talked about, but an output to you guys, to the to the hospital board, um, and to all to the Adams board. The whole the whole community. How are we progressing on those goals? Um, I think uh, she's going to be great help. She's done a great job with the multiple dashboards she helped us with. She's good at that. Um, so um, uh, uh, we did contract with her to retain her for through April, um, and uh, Chad was uh, was able to find me uh, nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety seven dollars and fifty two cents to pay her for those hours between now and April, and helping us on those projects. So uh, that's uh, that's the piece that was missing all those years. I mean, we're all busy. We all have our, our regular jobs. That's why reporting was weak on the on the health improvement plan. We want to make it robust this time around. That's my report. Legislative still a recess. So um, probably after they come back from elections, we'll have some more to talk about. <laughs> um, they're still considering that that bill where they're going to, you know, dismantle the DAC. Uh, we've done a lot of outreach. We've met with a lot of elected officials, kind of lobbying them. And uh, but um, and we're hoping we're hoping that this will just they will forget about it when they come back. It's a bad idea. All right. Ready to move to the next uh, item. OK, um, I did hear a from staff reporting back to me after the last meeting, 
um, a lot of you um, expressed that you would like to do some to recognize uh, uh, Bill Roos for all his contributions to public health. And, and I think it was a great idea. We always kind of uh, struggle on how to do that. If you remember, before right before the pandemic, we did discuss what establishing a champion of public health award. Uh, where on a yearly basis we'll nominate uh, um, a few names, then we'll bring them to the board, um, and the board will decide on a champion of public health award moving forward that, that's awarded to a person um, or organization that uh, contributed or helped with our, you know, helped us live our mission. Um, so I did include in your packet uh, uh, the hands, the actual kind of structure on how this is going to work. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, who can be nominated any individual group, but not employees of Hancock Public Health or board members um, or any affiliation with uh, with us. Uh, we uh, we would like for our staff, our leadership, the Board of Health to submit for nominations uh, because again, they're the one who worked with that individual or that organization to advance our, our mission. So um, they will bring him, then uh, leadership will go through him, will bring him to the board, um, and um, we'll we'll decide on um, on an <laughs> that year. Um, given that we're all agreed that um, uh, Bill coming <coughs> up, and um, I would ask the board to um, to proclaim um, that that the 2022 uh, public <laughs> champion award uh, be awarded um, to Bill Roos. Um, so once moved. We so second, we got second. All in favor, I guess. Nice. So um, so moving forward, uh, we will be working on nominations for next year between now and December. And in our uh, February meeting, we'll come in and decide on an award for the 2022, uh, right? So, so Bill Roos is 2021 then uh, for this past year. So, um, with that, we did uh, we did prepare a proclamation, and um, we will do that. We'll do that today. We'll vote. We all voted on it. We'll sign it. Um, the plan is for um, for next board meeting. At the end of the board meeting, we'll do a little, uh, we'll, uh, clarification. Yes. Um, the proclamation that I'm looking at talks about 2022. Yeah, I think it should be 20. Um, it's awarded in 2022, but this for the previous year. So now we're going to do nominations for 2023, but it will take into consideration the contribution of that individual for the 2022. So I think we want to keep calling it 2022 because that's okay. when you guys awarded it, yeah. but, uh, but it will be for the previous year. That's what I meant okay. for their contribution in the previous year. So um, I think we are, um, and um, Cheryl helped me with that a little bit yesterday as we were kind of figuring out a way and how to um, to remember the legacy of, of Bill Roos. And um, she did put together for me um, kind of a, Tentative. If you guys are okay with that plan, we'll move forward and, and keep organizing that. Um, it's, um, we're going to do a little remembrance for about half an hour, an hour after the board meeting, um, where we invite, um, you know, friends of the Roos and his family to come in um, and, um, you know, talk a little bit about his legacy. Uh, some of the board members will will speak and talk about his legacy, then we'll award, um, we'll award the, um, the actual we're looking at a little artifact that that will say, you know, like not a plaque, but but more often of uh, some that you put in a, in a cabinet or something like that, uh, that talks about awarding and we will do um, uh, the actual resolution on, uh, you know, in calligraphy type of paper. But that's the plan. Yes. Does the family know about this? No, I, that's why I want to run it by you before. This is not advertised yet. Because I just for your information, I've been trying to get a hold of Don and Bruce for the president of the Bar Association mm -hmm. because the Bar Association has a, a remembrance yeah. for any uh, mm -hmm. attorney who passes away. And she is not been difficult. She, does, she is not interested at all. 
So I just. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good to consider. Then I did not know that. I mean, yeah, Donna was I always with them on a lot of the meetings oh, that come to and stuff. But um, I thought you could be too soon, maybe. So, um, I think I don't know if you guys are okay with the plan. We can still reach out to her and try. Mm -hmm. But um, but nonetheless, we will. Um, um, if she doesn't want to be part of it, probably will deliver the award to her, but at least we'll we'll have his friends and and people who worked with Bill just to kind of remember him for a little bit. Um, I, I think we we owe him that and, and I think it's um, it would be a good gesture from the Board of Health. I'm going to try to get a hold of their son. I He's in Toledo. I don't have his contact information, but I'm sure I can get it and see if he even knows that Bar Association. Sure. So I think maybe you and Cheryl can compare notes, and if she gets the contacts before you do, or vice versa, maybe we can we can get to them a little quicker. Because as soon as you guys give us the okay to, to to do this, the first thing before we advertise anything, we're gonna reach out to the family, um, and make sure they're okay with that date, that time, with being part of that. And once they say yes, we're gonna make we're gonna make sure we get this out. So um, I think we'll, if you guys are okay with that, we'll we'll keep that plan and and keep moving on. Mm -hmm. All right. If you want to pass this around a little bit, like I said, I didn't make a lot of copies, but just to give you an idea, back um, on that, um, then we'll go from there. So um, we want to do um, we want to do a roll call for. Um, establishing the Champion of Public Health Award, um, given the terms that uh, highlighted and that I gave to all of you this morning. We'll need a first. Oh, we got, okay. All right, we'll just roll call then. Um, BJ is not, Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Bill? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right. So this is the plan moving forward, and then um, then we'll go from there. Uh, now, as uh, I would like to request a motion to move the board into executive session to discuss a personnel matter as it pertains to retention. So moved. Second. All those in favor, or do we got a roll call? That have to roll. Yes. Okay. Um, Nancy. Yes. Karen. Yes. Bill? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, we're moving into executive session at 9.38. BJ. BJ, I think she's right. on the call. You going to find her? Yeah. I didn't check the console ring because it was put. Should turn the recorder off? And the recorder?
of it. DJ's name. Motion. To, do you need a motion to come out of executive session? Oh, it can be. It can be Tate. Okay. Okay, it's 9.58. We need a motion to come out of executive session. So moved. Second. Okay. Oh. All right, we're out. Coming out of executive session. All in favor. Board action. All in favor. Aye. Coming out. Aye. Aye. All right. Um, I'm requesting a motion of the board to approve a retention bonus. Uh, it's pay for all staff and the recognition and loyalty and dedication to public health services in Hancock County. Uh, it's a one time non personable bonus retention bonus. It's based on employees annual salary, excluding fringe multiplied by 3%. Uh, the dollar amount is capped at 1500 maximum per employee as prescribed in the Ohio Department of Health's grants, administrative policies and procedures i.e. O-G-A-P-P, -P, if you don't know the letters there, manual. So moved. Second. Roll call. Yes. BJ? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Bill? Yes. And Brian? Absolutely. Okay. Motion adopted. All right. There will be no continuing education today. I think it was a long meeting. <laughs> Thank you for sticking around. Uh, our next meeting will be November 18th. Uh, at 730, same place. And uh, it is 959 and uh, we need a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Out of here. Yes. All right. <laughs>